Hi, Tony. How are you? Hi, I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Well, how are you? you? I'm very good, too. Thank you, because I'm sitting here with you now. All right. <laughs> Great. So, Tony, you are the singer and primary songwriter for Sonata Arctica. And you've been an active musician since the mid-90s, maybe even. Uh, well, before. yeah. I had my first show with the band. I think it was 94. Okay. So it's been 20 years and some. But, but with this band since 96 and as a Sonata Arctica since 99. So Exactly. Yeah. So basically 20 plus years of music musicianship. How different is it today to be a musician compared to when you started? Well, um, internet and all those things have, have changed a lot of things, you know. We didn't have YouTube when we started, of course, and, and you could actually play like um, songs live before you go in the studio. But these days, if you do that, it's pretty much the same thing if you actually release the album because it, or, or the song, because it's, it's, um, it's going to be on YouTube everywhere and there's no controlling it. People actually have the song already there and it's not, not a surprise. But back in the days, you know, you could play unreleased songs live and, and maybe someone made a bootleg out of it, but it wasn't a worldwide thing right away. But that's, I think, the biggest thing. And, uh, and uh, definitely the business has gone much, it uh, has gotten a lot tougher, tougher. of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. so that said, do you approach writing or composing music differently today than back in the days? Um, maybe, but it's some kind of you know unconscious thing, I think. Okay. More or less, because it, um, back in the day when I started, it, 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 it was more of a hobby for me, of course. And, and, and mm -hmm. the longer you make it and you realize that, okay, this is my profession. Every time you start playing guitar or keyboards and, you know, doodling around, having fun, you really quickly realize that you're actually working. That, that, that what I do here is I'm, I'm composing and, oh, this might actually turn out to be something and I better record it, whatever it is that I'm doing here right now. And, and it, it has become more serious, I'd say. You know, can't put out just anything. Although, yeah, well, at times I, I put out really wild things for Sonata Antarctica, but but uh, but uh, I, I try to stay professional with it as well, and, and just you know, keep Sonata Antarctica the way Sonata Antarctica is supposed to be. We've done some adventuring on our day, but but now we're back on a real track, I'd, I'd say. Exactly. And if I come up with something too wild, I'm gonna just leave it for my solo album or whatever. Okay, so you tried actually to to stick to the, as we say in German, a red line. Across yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, that's that's the idea. Well, I think everything we have released, and they have some kind of red line, but it's been stretching <laughs> quite a bit. You know, we've we've gone to this more progressive thing from pretty straightforward power metal of our early days, and and uh, we have the previous album, Stone Score Her Name. It was um, it was rock album. It had a few metal songs in it there, but but, but still it was it was mostly rock, pop rock kind of thing. You know, it, it was most mellow album of Sonata Arctica thus far. And uh, now Pariah's Child again, it's it's back on the route where we were set. More power metal, yeah, more power right? power metal. I think it, it's it's continuing the uh, same path as what we were on back in you know the, I'd say four first albums, like Reckoning Night was kind of. Conjunction where we started to go in the different direction with Unia and uh, had three albums or four albums in, in the different way. And now we're back, back uh, doing what we were maybe supposed to do. <laughs> well <Yeah>. said, sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, in an interview I saw on uh, YouTube, <laughs> you were mentioning that uh, while you were playing um, songs from the mid 2000s, you were actually watching the audience and you realized that certain songs didn't catch up with them. That's at least how I perceived your answer from there. And so would you say that um, you try to, to, to be conscious of your, let's call it the marketplace? Mm -hmm. you know, if, people, if you think people might not like Sonata Arctica's new stuff that much, that you would adjust the direction? Uh, for a long time, um, you know, starting from uni actually on, I didn't, could not have cared less. You know, it, I was making new music, music mainly for myself. I wanted to please myself with whatever it was that I was doing musically and, and be happy about it. And I didn't care. And I know if I love what I do, there's got to be other people who like it as well. And how can I even expect anyone like my music if I don't like it myself? That's the starting point. I think that's a healthy view on, on, on this subject, really. But but um, I was, uh, after Reckoning Night, uh, the album prior to uh, Unia, I was really tired and was not at all happy with what we were doing so it was kind of catharsis for me to do something different 
and it kind of allowed us to uh, continue and 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 uh, just morph into what we are today. Okay. You know, it's a painful process, of course. You know, we had some lineup changes and everything happening, as mainly the guitar player, then and, and now now a year ago the bass player as well. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's been brewing for a long, long time, all those changes. And I think the current lineup, what we have, it's, it's really healthy. We are happy what we are doing and, and we're back on the right tracks, definitely. You started off with Spineform Records, right? That was uh, the first three albums, if I'm correct. Yes, yeah. And then you had uh, the opportunity to change to a more established record label like uh, Nuclear Blast, which yeah. you're still on. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're still, still with them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so was that also maybe a turning point for the band? You know, or different differently asked what effect did it have on the band uh, were you more motivated or did it maybe give you a different kind of stress factor no well, i didn't um, really see any stress there but you know maybe the biggest change i see there is that uh, we had more we had a major label like biggest metal label mm -hmm. in the world you know behind us and they had their channels and everything so it was it was a big change for us in that way Oh, but you know, Spine Farm turned into Universal, and then they had like a <laughs> really big company behind them later on. But 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 still, at the time, uh, uh, Spine, um, I mean, Nuclear Blast, they made the best offer. It was actually matched by one other label, you know, Central Media. They were battling, but we had already made up our, our minds and we wanted to go on Nuclear Blast. Who wanted to sign us already with the first album, you know? Okay. Back then, back in the day, we heard later, you know, like license us from Spine mm -hmm. Farm, but but Central Media took, a, you know, price back then, <laughs> but it, it was really, really, we felt happy. It felt like home, you know. So that was the reason why you chose Nuclear Blast instead of Century Media. Yeah, it was a, something that you know we already had some connections there in that okay. direction, and we just wanted to go there. It seemed like a really good choice for us at the time. And can't explain it really. <laughs> okay, well, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's also an explanation. <laughs> yeah. So, and I saw that you do lots, or did, and still do, lots of guest appearances. Um, Nightwish, Heavenly, Stratovarius, Epica, and so on. Uh, Apocalyptica, of course. Yeah. And what is the idea behind that? Is it more to expand yourself artistically, or is there maybe a branding uh, perspective to it? Adam, it's, it's like a combo of all those things. Of course, you know, you reach the other audience, the, the other bands, the fans of the other bands, especially when you go wandering around your own genre somewhere doing something totally different and, and the totally different people hear you and, and see you and, and, and maybe get interested in what you are doing with your main thing, being Sonatarctica in this case. And uh, it, it's fun, you know, and, and of course there's, it's you always, it, it's a job, it's work. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, there's always the financial side, of course, involved there. It's not just, you know, someone stealing my time and, and my work, you know, it's just, you know, there's a compensation behind it. And, and it's, it's, it's nice to be able to do something like that uh, with, when, when there's free time, when the Sonata Arctica has to be the priority, but whenever there's like other, when there's an opportunity, I enjoy recording stuff for other bands, you know, that I deem worthy and I, I, I'm interested in and the, the songs are interesting and or then I just like the people, you know, you get to know people and it's, it's fun to work with them again. Like uh, I'm uh, when I get home from this tour, uh, I'm going to record something for uh, Trick or Treat, you know, mm -hmm. the band we were touring on the previous European touring. You know, it's going to be fun. Heard the song for the first time last night, actually. So okay. it, yeah, it's, it's going to be great. So that kind of stuff. Great. And how do you uh, approach that? Do you think for yourself, oh, that is a like trick or treat great band that I would like to sing w or collaborate with, or do they primarily ask you? First? Yeah, it's the other way around. Yeah, they ask me. I, I never want to, you know, just uh, barge in and uh, I'm gonna sing one song for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Although you know, the case actually was that um, with um, Power Glove. The American band was playing this game music, and they were recording a new album. And I, I we were touring with them in North America, and and I just said, hey, I would love to do something with you guys, and if chance, and I'd like to sing some, sing something, you know, pro bono for free because they're great guys, and it was a lot of fun touring with them. So I did like two little songs for them. Pokemon and, and Simpsons theme, <laughs> which are <laughs> great fun. Yeah, it, 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 it was it was weird and fun, and you know, just you know, hell yeah, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, you are you're the singer of the band, 
songwriter. How much do you get involved in the business side of it? Do you have a manager who you delegate everything to him or her, uh, or do you actually want something to say? No, of, of course, you know, models. when uh, the big hammer hits, you know, I want to be there as well, you know, to see what we are getting into. Uh, we're not blind or stupid in that sense, of course, but, but there are a lot of things like everyday business side things that we couldn't even understand some lawyer stuff uh, and, and such. So it's uh, we have a management, of course, taking care of that that side of things. And, and uh, oftentimes, even when I'm when I'm, I'm dealing with other bands, like these projects that we just talked about, you know, I sometimes ask for an advice, you know, how should I approach this thing? Because uh, there are so many aspects that you need to consider before you jump in and then do something, you know. Sure. So yeah, instead yeah. of just jumping in and you making know, a mistake, course, you'd uh, rather uh, just take a step it. back. And yeah, yeah, just, you know, take it slowly. Unless it's like this trick or treat band, for example. It's like, ah, fuck, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do it. <laughs> nothing to it. It's cool. So, but, but there are some other things that you never know what you're putting your head into, you know. You know. So just a pragmatic approach so that you yeah, can gotta, be sure. Yeah, be careful mm -hmm. and, and try to be smart about what I, what I get into. But, you know, of course, it's, it's important to have uh, people taking care of the business that we really don't know that much about. We want to know everything, but it's impossible. You know, I, I used to be a control freak early of our career. Okay. I took, you know, I, I was trying to get involved in everything, including lights on a show and everything. And now we have uh, the, the dude who's uh, taking care of our lightings. Uh, yesterday, he had our 600th show Whoa. with Sonata Arctica. <laughs> you know, so the, I, like a few hundred shows ago, <laughs> I kind of realized that oh, maybe this dude actually knows what he's doing and I just let him... Let, yeah, yeah. yeah, if sometimes I may have an idea that it would be great to have a spot there or whatever. I'm like, yeah, sure, yeah, let's but get you, it done. But I'll let him like just take care of that. He's like an extra band member. Oh, that, that's that great. He's, he's playing lights. He's playing lights. Uh, yeah. I like that. That sounds good to me. <laughs> Uh, artist development. Uh, we meet many musicians from er everywhere in the world and artist development is always a uh, big issue. Um, small bands, they have to do it themselves. I mean, if you think back uh, in 70s, 80s, it was actually the label's job to develop artists. Yeah. Um, how do you see it today with Sonata Arctica? I mean, you've been around for um, 50, almost 20 years, basically, right? Mm. Um, how is the art, your artist development of your band today different than 20 years ago? I don't know. Well, we just were a kind of homegrown okay. in a way that we, we were always allowed to do just about what we want. They try to push us in, in certain directions and make us wear certain kind of clothing, but they failed miserably always. <laughs> <laughs> funny, funny example being that our label in Japan, they, I think it was during our second album, Silence Tour or whatever, they approached me with an email that well, how would I like to would it be possible for me to wear like like uh, something like Ingvi Malmsteen wears like tight like leather pants and, and this pyrox type white yeah. shirt and everything with with the decorations and, and stuff and I was like uh, with uh, all due respect but you do not have enough money to make me wear such thing <laughs> so it, it kind of killed the conversation there and then I we've been doing pretty much whatever we like ever since and so we, uh, we're we happy, of course, but you know, th there are moments, I think, in every young band's life that it would be really good if there was some firm hand pushing them in a certain direction, not giving them what they what the band said, but telling them, no, you do it like this, no matter how Tony's they have there, like, I'm stubborn, I don't want to do that. But, but you know, there should be like a fatherly hand letting leading the band in a correct direction, visually and, 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 and so on. A little bit education, which we never had any, anyways. Uh, that so, kind of. so how did you do it? Just trial it's and error? Zero, well, yeah, we figured, out, okay, black is good. <laughs> Put it on. <laughs> and music-wise, you know, earlier of our career, we were following, of course, great examples like Stradivarius and, and it, it put us straight in the uh, correct direction, I'd say. Okay. And everybody was happy, but you know, then I started adventuring a little bit and mm -hmm. uh, started to. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the label people they got a lot of gray hair because of that. You know, I was pretty effectively killing a good business, but uh, it was 
music meant more to me than the business side of things. And, and, and no matter how many albums we were selling back in the day, I just wanted to be happy doing what I do. Not burn out at young age. Of course. <laughs> of course not. Good. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about the music marketplace per se today. At the beginning of the interview, you were mentioning that uh, today it's different with the uh, internet compared to in the 90s where we didn't really have Spotify, iTunes, and an end. Do you feel the, well, basically you already answered, do you, you feel the effects. Um, how do you feel the effects today? Just simply through less CD sales or? Well, that's, that's the first, you know, indicator, of course, you know, when you realize that, okay, there is this free service, basically free service that you don't really get any money from and, and, and that they, you're supposed to put the album there right away when it's released for everybody to hear. And uh, okay, wow, the album sales went down. Hmm. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> What a, do you do it's next? A, it's a really simple equation, actually. There's, there's mm -hmm. nothing to it. And the music business is, 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 I think it's a necessary step. It's unfortunate that a lot of bands will fall. You know, it, it just, it is going to happen. And, you know, a lot of bands are getting back to that place where it's only a hobby. They can't do any major tours or, you know, put enough time in this business because you need to live. You need to have a normal life. You know, you may want to have kids and a family and then the same as the next guy. You know, normal life that nobody, everybody can pretty much forget the millions. It's, 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 I think it's, Same as winning in a lottery, if you actually get rich with this business nowadays. It, like I think it's James Simmons used to say that he was the last generation of those who actually got into big bucks <laughs> with music. But you know, there are still a few. But but um, it has changed, and it's a it's a, a you know, kind of end game for a lot of bands going on, and it's it's up to each band to see and make sure that they stay relevant and, and important and the fans still want to buy the albums and, and support the band and keep the live music alive. Exactly, keep the live music alive. Yeah. So would you say that is the, that is the, let's say, one of the solutions? Yeah, of course, you know, playing live is really important. It's, it's the big part of the thing, but, but also, you know, band <laughs> cannot be on the road 365 days a year. It's just not happening, mm -hmm. you know, because people have families and everything and you need to create the albums, of course. It used to be the different back in the uh, 70s mm -hmm. when, you know, band came home and spent a week there and <laughs> recorded an album or two and went back on the road and it was like life on the road. But the, the uh, lifespan of those bands were often often really short too. So, but... Because you want it to be um, sustainable. Yeah, sustainable exactly. System. So the life has, and the world has changed a lot since, and it's different. Do you think that it would help to um, many bands or artists? They go into, for instance, uh, game music, right? That they license the music to games or um, yeah, make games. It would be great if it worked like that for everybody. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, um, there are a lot of games happening, but you know, a lot of lot of the major game houses they also have their own composers or they you know they uh, take the music from really well established bands and and they don't have an interest of supporting someone who's nothing really like or some underground thing more or less you know like you know a lot of games and i don't want to advertise any of the big sure. games happening at the moment but you know you know still you know but it, it's it's when you go go in a certain direction and start doing something you always Well, let's put it this way: that you cannot bow for everybody. You're showing your ass to some, some of some part of the crowd as well. And, and a lot of the fans might might get upset if we were selling ourselves, you know, by putting our all the music on some computer game or whatever. So, it's, I, I think it's a good way, a uh, good point that you already um, that you see that. That's, yeah, that's already... of course, you know, I, I'd like to do a lot of stuff, but you know, at sure. time, yeah, that'd be <laughs> of great. Course. Um, a question which we like to ask often, do you think that albums still matter as compared to a single since the marketplace nowadays, you know, different platforms, you can just buy one song instead of a whole album, like back in the days when you had a vinyl or a CD? Mm, yeah, I think for me anyways, album is really relevant because I, I enjoy making like whole packages, you know, with, with covers and everything. And, and, and there's some kind of red line that goes through the album 
although it's it's like our albums, they are not concept albums by no means, but, but still, there are a lot of songs, and and you kind of build the next two years around that bunch of songs. And if we were just releasing one song at a time and writing one song at a time and then releasing it, it would change the game so drastically. We'd be on the road constantly, and it would be really stressful. I don't know how the bands in the seventies dealt with it but it, it was a different world less everything less competition you know and of course we're talking about this big labels building the brand and everything you know bands back in the day it was good you know in, in a way because I, people believed the label the label the big labels they were gods you know and they built bands that were gods as well so it's different these days people are more cynical and and uh, maybe it's good maybe it's not but but i don't know i'm a nostalgic kind of guy and i miss those good old days <laughs> as many other artists yeah. also do yeah i bet sure well tony thank you very much thank it was you. very interesting uh, a lot of um, fun on the tour hey thank you very much and uh, hope to see you soon again hey thank you very much tony all the best Let's do it again cheers